What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Dr. Craig Blomberg of Denver Seminary as he defends the historical Jesus. This guy is supposed to be an expert in the area of historical Jesus study, so I'm only expecting the best evidence for Jesus that we have. If you want to fuck around and find out how this New Testament scholar defends the historical Jesus, then please stay tuned. Hey heathens, before we get into the video today, I just wanted to let you know that it's being supported by the Crestus app. Well, it's my app, but uh, if you want more information about the historical Jesus and, and why mythicism is a very viable hypothesis as well as a legitimate debate, then definitely download the Crestus app today. It's available on Apple iStore and on Google Play. Craig Blomberg. I am the Distinguished Professor of New Testament at Denver Seminary, and this is What Do You Mean? Did Jesus exist? The answer for any serious, thoughtful person has to be an overwhelming yes. So whenever we're discussing the scholarly consensus surrounding the historical Jesus, we should really pay attention to whether or not the scholar that's being used can give us an unbiased view of history as it pertains to Jesus. Now, Craig Blomberg here is a distinguished professor of New Testament studies at the Denver Seminary. My first red flag is the fact that he's a professor at a seminary. But that doesn't mean he can't be trusted, right? Well, I feel like Denver Seminary can't give us accurate information about the historical Jesus. For one thing, Denver Seminary states, students and seminary staff are required to affirm and sign the National Association of Evangelical Statement of Faith, which one of their points in the Statement of Faith is, we believe the Bible to be inspired the only infallible, authoritative word of God. And later, in another point, it states, We believe in the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his virgin birth, in his sinless life, in his miracles, in his vicarious and atoning death through his shed blood, in his bodily resurrection, in his ascension to the right hand of the Father, and in his personal return in power and glory. When I read this, what I get from it is that they affirm the historical nature not only of Jesus' death, but also his resurrection, as well as his virgin birth. Now, considering that all of this information is only affirmed by a view that has the Gospels as being historical documents, which they aren't, it seems like Denver Seminary requires both faculty and students to assert that the Bible is inerrant in both the Old and the New Testament. Let me restate this. In order to work there, you have to believe that the Bible is a historical document. How can we be expected to trust a distinguished professor that is required to sign a statement of faith that is contrary to the consensus of scholars in New Testament studies. Oh, but you might claim they're accredited. Well, let's take a look at Denver Seminary's accreditation. They are accredited by the Higher Learning Commission to grant degrees on the master's and doctorate's level. But the criteria for accreditation by the Higher Learning Commission seems to disqualify Denver Seminary from being accredited. Specifically, criteria 2.D says, the institution is committed to academic freedom and freedom of expression in the pursuit of truth in teaching and learning. How can any educational institution be accredited by the Higher Learning Commission when it requires its students and faculty to sign a statement of faith? A statement that restricts academic freedom and freedom of expression in the pursuit of truth in teaching and learning. If one of their faculty, staff, or students start agreeing with the monumental consensus that Abraham, Noah, Moses, and all the patriarchs never existed in history, then they are going to have to quit working there or going to school there. How is this academic freedom? The fact is, is that there are about 1,500 degree-granting institutions that have religious studies programs. 
Of those 1,500, most of them require some kind of statement of faith to be signed in order to go there or teach there. And the consequence of breaking this statement of faith in one way or another is termination, at least until you can agree with the statement of faith again. How are we supposed to trust scholars from these institutions? I've never heard of any other branch of education that requires the signing of a statement of faith or statement of belief. The Christians that consider the Bible to be the inerrant word of God are the ones that are controlling the consensus on historical Jesus studies. And I mean, sure, you can probably pull up a few token agnostics or atheists or non-Christian scholars in New Testament studies, but the numbers of those kinds of scholars are dwarfed by the immense amount of Christian New Testament scholars. And most of those scholars are bound by their faith to believe in things that are contrary to history. One can certainly debate what kind of a person he was. One can debate if all the teachings we have in the New Testament ascribed to him are accurate. Those are legitimate scholarly debates. It's not a legitimate debate to ask if Jesus existed. Yes, it is a legitimate debate to ask whether or not Jesus existed. We have questioned the historicity of many people in the past, and only through a rigorous investigation of the evidence have we established that people most likely existed. There are currently two peer-reviewed books in the scholarship that question the historicity of Jesus. Richard Carrier's On the Historicity of Jesus and Raphael Letaster's questioning the historicity of Jesus. While Carrier comes to a 66% chance that Jesus probably didn't exist in history, Raphael Letaster ends up agnostic. Their books have yet to be challenged by scholarship. The methods used by Christian scholars like Dr. Craig here are bunk and have been known to be bunk for a long time. They literally have to invent criteria that is not used in other areas of history. They also have to twist information and present speculation as historical fact. Considering that Dr. Craig hails from Denver Seminary, which we just showed we can't really trust to give us accurate information about the historical Jesus, it makes total sense that he would see this entire debate as illegitimate. It's illegitimate to him because it has to be illegitimate. Not because there is no argument to be had, but because if he did engage in this argument, he could be fired. There are roughly a dozen non-Christian works from ancient Jewish, Greek, and Roman sources. If you put their composite testimony together, you learn that Jesus was a Jew living in the first third of the first century, that he was born out of wedlock. The only independent references that we have to Jesus come in the form of Paul's epistles. And that is where all of our information about any kind of historical Jesus comes from. Paul wasn't an eyewitness to Jesus. Paul received his information from visions or hallucinations and through a reading of the scriptures. He explicitly tells us this in Galatians 1, 11 through 12. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. At the start of Christianity, every apostle had to separate themselves from any kind of historical source. This is because this kind of knowledge could only ever come from God. As Proverbs 2 6 tells us, For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So the only way that anybody could get information about Jesus was if Jesus told them himself after he became the Lord, which occurred after he resurrected. Every single non-Christian source about Jesus was informed by the Gospels and by Paul. This single fact alone means that all non-Christian sources are dependent on the first Christian source. Considering this, Paul never records anything about Jesus' time on earth. He only records the message of Jesus after he resurrected. So we don't know if he was ever born or the circumstances surrounding his birth. The first Christians were Jewish Christians, so it would totally make sense for Jesus to also be a Jew. Christianity is just an extension of Judaism, so it would be kind of weird if he wasn't Jewish. That his ministry intersected with that of a man named John, who called on Jewish people to repent of their sins and show it by being baptized that he had a brother by the name of James, 
that in his adult life, like other rabbis, self-styled and formally commissioned, uh, he gathered disciples. Five of them are named uh, in these non-Christian sources. We know nothing about Jesus's time on earth because Paul doesn't record any of it. So we don't know that Jesus's ministry intersected with John the Baptist. We don't know that Jesus had a brother named James just because a James is mentioned, which James is one of the most common names in the first century, that Paul called a brother of the Lord. Paul's theology on the family of God makes this particular phrase problematic. When addressing fellow Christian men, Paul calls them brothers. And when addressing Christian women, Paul calls them sisters. So it kind of seems like whenever Paul is using these familial terms, he is referencing a fictive kinship between him and the other person, not some kind of blood relationship. Now, the word that Paul uses here can mean a blood relationship, but without a further indication that he's talking about a blood relationship, we're just left with a fictive kinship as the most likely definition of the word. Oh, and the disciples probably never existed either. This is because Paul, having never mentioned anything about Jesus' time on earth, never indicates that anybody is a disciple. When he refers to Peter, he only refers to him as an apostle. Plenty of apologists out there claim that there's no difference between apostles and disciples, but there is a stark difference between the two. Apostles received revelation of Jesus after he died. Disciples would have walked with Jesus while he was living. So if any historical source tells us that this person was a disciple of Jesus, then we know that that source got their information from the Gospels in one fashion or another. The Gospels did not record history. They only recorded theology. He regularly taught things that made him fall afoul of the Jewish authorities in his world unconventional approaches to scripture, to the law. This ultimately led to his arrest and crucifixion. Uh, we know none of this from independent sources about Jesus. Paul never discusses the Jewish authorities and their reaction to Jesus and his teaching. Paul never speaks about Jesus being arrested. In the Pauline Creed, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul does mention that Christ died. For I delivered to you as of first importance, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. But if you'll notice, whenever Paul is talking about Jesus dying and resurrecting, it's always according to the scriptures. Paul doesn't know that these events really happened because he historically investigated Jesus's death and resurrection. Paul only knows about these events because they were foretold in the scriptures. It makes no sense to force Paul into getting his information from historical sources, which he never cites, when Paul himself tells us directly that he only ever gets his information from visions and scripture. Tacitus, the Roman historian, explicitly says he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, who we know from other sources was uh, the governor in Judea from 36, uh, from 26 to 36 AD, uh, and that despite this ignominious and cruel death, his followers continued to believe that he was the Messiah, the Jewish liberator, because they also believed uh, that they had seen him raised from the dead. Allow me to quote Robert Van Voorst, Jesus outside the New Testament. Does this testimonium tacitum therefore provide definitive evidence of the existence of Jesus? If we could be certain that Tacitus's account was based on non-Christian sources, the answer would be yes. But as we have seen, such independent knowledge is unverifiable. As R.T. France concludes, while the evidence from Tacitus corroborates the New Testament accounts of the death of Jesus, by itself it cannot prove that events happened as Tacitus has been informed, or even the existence of Jesus. This latter, France correctly argues, has abundant persuasive evidence in the New Testament. Tacitus, careful historian that he was, presumed the existence of Jesus and had no reason to doubt it. Van Voorst was also a teaching professor at Western Theological Seminary. 
That institution also requires a statement of faith in order to work and go to school there. Now, I'm not bringing up Van Boer simply because I agree with him. I'm bringing him up because he represents the same kind and quality of scholar that what do you mean or John McRae would also use in order to prove his point. Coincidentally, Van Voorst's idea about Tastis as well as R.T. France and the plethora of other scholars out there is the only explanation that is able to explain the evidence that we have given Tacitus. And I definitely disagree with Van Voorst on a number of his conclusions. For instance, I think that the information contained in Tacitus is most likely interpolated. We've already been able to show that through forensic analysis, the original word used there was not Christos, but Crestus and Christians. I also believe that the highly Christian section of Tacitus is most likely interpolated. Regardless of all of that, though, at face value, Tacitus only places Christians in Rome in 64 CE. That's all he does, and it's completely in line with mythicism. If this section in Tacitus is legitimate, then Tacitus would have gotten his information from a Christian source, either directly or indirectly. And he never questioned the historicity of the statements. I could probably add into that mix Josephus' testimony that he worked wondrous deeds. Paradoxon, the word we get paradox from in English that most scholars think refers in some way to what Christians call his miracles. That's just from reading ancient non-Christian sources, people who are not convinced to become believers. You know, I have a great clip on my Gallus Engineer Shorts channel where I discuss the various problems with the Testimonium Flavianum. If you want a full refutation of the Testimonium Flavianum, I would suggest checking that video out. Long story short, the passage in Josephus was most likely inserted by a Christian scholar most similar to Eusebius or Eusebius's mentor. In the chronology of Josephus's writings, this spot would have been where Josephus would have mentioned Jesus if Josephus knew about Jesus. Christian apologists tend to try to salvage this passage by claiming that it was interpolated by a later Christian scribe, but there is a core that is true. This is somewhat wishful thinking because there is no evidence at all to suggest that an earlier version of the Testimonium Flavianum existed. The only version that we have ever known to exist is the one with the highly Christian portions. Obviously, this does not mean that there isn't a version of the Testimonium Flavianum that predates our extant version. But speculating that there was a previous version of the Testimonium Flavianum is just an ad hoc assumption with literally no foundation. If we remember that most of the first Christians were people who did not start life as Christian, but became convinced through both evidence and testimony and their own personal experience of the truth of Christianity, then the evidence for Jesus uh, becomes far greater. No, it literally does not become greater. Just because people become convinced does not mean that what they now believe is true. Plenty of people over the past four years have slipped into the QAnon conspiracy theory. Just because they were convinced of the QAnon conspiracy, does that make it true? I don't think it does. The initial Christian converts were not convinced by evidence. They were convinced just by hearing the message of Jesus. Justin Martyr is a prime example of this with his whole read it and believe it attitude. He heard the Christian message and without any evidence whatsoever, he believed it. Sometimes it's far easier to believe in false information than it is to believe in true information. And then add to the fact there's no religion in the history of the world that didn't have one particular dominant personality behind it. To think that people somehow invented a religion without a founder uh, takes more faith to believe in than it does to believe that Jesus existed. Except when it all traces back to one man named Paul. In a similar fashion to Mormonism tracing all the way back to Joseph Smith, Paul is the real father of modern Christianity. His version of Christianity won out amongst all the other different versions of Christianity. We have evidence of these 
other versions of Christianity in the Nag Hammadi texts. There were several different versions of Christ floating around in the first century. In fact, Paul had to warn others about false teachers. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.13 These were people that were teaching a different version of Christ than Paul was teaching. Since Paul had visions of Jesus, he could trust his message over these fake apostles. So the next time someone says to you, I don't think Jesus existed, or how can we know that he really existed? What are you going to say? Look in the camera and go, what do you mean? Something like that. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> the next time someone wants to discuss the historical Jesus, don't quote some dumb fucking catchphrase. I actually have a discussion about the evidence. And don't argue about who has the most scholars supporting their position. Focus on the evidence for Jesus and try to figure out why your interlocutor believes the things that they do. It may change your mind on the question altogether. And I don't care which conclusion you come to. I just care that you carefully consider your position and why you believe what you believe. The current state of New Testament studies is abysmal. Of the 1,500 degree-granting institution with religious studies programs, most of them require some kind of statement of faith in order to teach there and go to school in. This ultimately restricts them from honestly engaging in a discussion on the historical Jesus. It would prevent them from applying the same historiographical method that we would apply to other figures such as Alexander the Great. Now, this doesn't mean that all New Testament scholars are bad or that all of them are required to sign a statement of faith, but it kind of seems like most of them do have to sign that statement of faith. While you're sure to find non-Christian scholars in New Testament studies that affirm that Jesus existed, the fact of the matter is the consensus is controlled by this majority of Christian scholars, and a majority of those Christian New Testament scholars are bound by statements of faith. Thank you, heathens, for joining me today. Let me know what you guys think about Dr. Craig Blomberg and his defense of the historical Jesus. Do you really think that it's important to squibble over scholars and which scholars support which position? Or do you really just care about the evidence for Jesus? Let me know down in the comments below. And hey, while you're down there, why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you like mythicist content like this. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens.